solid rocket ignition, and liftoff, liftoff of Endeavour on America's 50th space shuttle flight. As America strives to continue its leadership in science, technology, and space, find out what the first female African-American astronaut has to teach us about science education, success, and achieving individual excellence, next on Living Smart. Welcome to Living Smart, the show designed to help you get the most out of life. A Renaissance woman, chemical engineer, scientist, physician, teacher, dancer, and former astronaut Dr. Mae Jemison was also the first African-American woman in space. She blasted into orbit aboard the space shuttle Endeavour on September 12, 1992, and since then she has worked tirelessly to improve science and technology education in America and the world, and particularly to encourage women and minorities to pursue careers in those fields. She now heads the Jemison Group, Inc., which researches, markets, and develops science and technology for data life. Today she'll share her thoughts on leadership, exploration, science education, and lessons from the most important teacher in her life, her mother. Dr. Mae Jemison, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> You're it's welcome. great to have you. And um, you knew as a five-year-old you wanted to be a scientist, which I think is totally <laughs> unusual at five. I was probably just climbing up trees. Um, how can parents help kids find that, that passion so early on in life? Well, you know what? I think most five-year-olds like being the idea of being a scientist. Why do I say that? Because think about what you're doing at five, three, four years old. Exploring. You're picking up bugs. You're exploring. You're looking at the snails. You're looking at the stuff in the couch. You're trying to make mud pies. You're trying to figure out how all this stuff works, which is really what science is about. So, you know, for me, maybe wanting to do it as a profession is a little different. You know, when my, my teacher asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a scientist. is because I knew that I always wanted this sort of life of exploration. But, you know, I also wanted to be uh, a dancer. I wanted to be a fashion designer. Right. You know, <laughs> you I wanted to be an old. architect at different times. Right. But it's, you know, it was really about that creativity, that exploration. And when we ask how do we get our children to find that, right. it's really we have to keep them from losing it. How mm. do we keep them from losing it? By not, you know, beating it out of them. I think when kids go to school, they're told to stop exploring the world, stop using their creativity. You know, when they come up with questions that as an adult we don't have the answer for, we get tired of we say, oh, leave us alone, don't right, ask that right. question. Go watch TV. So, go, or you put them in front of TV. It's, it's that exploration that you have to allow them to maintain. It's that also that play, because I remember when we were growing up, we were able to play. Kids don't play anymore. They play video games, but they're not playing with new things outside. Remember how great it was to touch something, new yeah. textures. Um, my favorite like really bugs. was mud pies, you know. But, <laughs> you know, another thing I liked, and this is going to sound really awful, I loved pus. Yeah, well, I've heard time, that before. <laughs> I, the, no, the first time I, you know, I had a little sore and I had a fingernail, you know, a splinter on the fingernail and it got infected and pus came out of it. I was so fascinated by it. <laughs> I, I was just like, wow, this is something cool. My mother told me it helped fight germs and she told me to go look it up. So I'd go read about it. But it, it's those things where you're finding out what's going on in your world. You know, right, when right. you spin yourself around and you figure out there's something called dizzy, right? All right. of those things are about Ask exploring your words. Your right? Ask and questions. try things. And, you know, your mother was a teacher and your dad was a maintenance supervisor. They both cared a lot about your education, about especially the, the, the motivating you. Um, what are some of the, the things that they did that allowed you to become who you are today? Well, let me tell you, I really did choose my parents well. I did a great That's job. Right. You I, came I, you I chose well. That's okay. right. You but chose well. But I also well. was in a really interesting place because I was my I had an older sister and an older brother. Okay. So I had an opportunity to be a busybody from the very beginning. So all of my, you know, my sister had science projects. I used oh, to play good. around with her science projects. My brother had science projects. So being three, four years younger than them, I had an opportunity to participate right then. Okay. And again, I don't think it's really about motivating your kids. I think it's about allowing them to maintain their motivation, about not demotivating them. How does that happen? It's by letting me make mistakes. You know, one of the things that sometimes as parents we're afraid of is our children making mistakes, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Or even as adults, we're afraid of making mistakes, so we don't try things, so right. we never find our boundaries. Right. And so what my parents did, I, I used to make mistakes. Um, you know, I, I got challenged 
a lot. My mother would uh, challenge so me to do things. She intellectually challenged you or intellectually, she emotionally challenged you? And all of the above. Everything. Like, give me examples of what she would do. Uh, well, it depends on the age group. So, for ex I was I was a very bright kid, uh -huh. and my sister was very bright. My sister was like teacher's pet, just the the love of life, you know. God's <laughs> gift. <laughs> but anyway, she's really wonderful. No, she was really wonderful, Ada. And my brother was, you know, he was right behind her, which was an awful place to be going through school. But that's, but what were the, some of the challenges? She would, my mother would. Um, you know, tell me to look things up. One of the things that I thought was most unfair about her <laughs> is that I would ask her how to spell a word, and she would tell me to look it up. And I said, how can I spell the word if I look it up if I can't spell the word? She says, sound it out. But those <laughs> kinds of things. She didn't go away and leave She me, didn't make it she easy. Did, she, she had you use your own devices. I also remember when I wanted to take dance classes. Uh, I, was, I was in third grade, eight years old, and this was, um, I was in Chicago. She took me to this place called Sadie Bruce. Turns out it was a really famous dance school. And I used to go there. She would take me there, and then my sister would take me there. And then I started going by myself because it was something I wanted to continue to do. Right. So at nine years old, I would get on the, on the L train. And I would go to dance classes because it was something I wanted to do. She'd make us take, have us take art classes, all of those things. Um, and I don't want to leave out my dad because sometimes people ask me, you know, you've been involved in all these male-dominated fields. How is that for you? How did you get through? Well, my dad was a man's man. He hunted and fished. He did construction work, all of those kinds of things. And he and his friends liked to hang out with me. I'd, I'd rather they let me hang out with them. <laughs> they let you hang out with them. <laughs> but I played cards with them. So, and right. I learned how to count cards and all those kind of things. And any time I think about, you know, if I, if I could hold my own with these guys, at least it felt that way, <laughs> then it was, you know, it was really not that much of a challenge to hold my own with the guys in my class, the right. males in my class. So I right. think that was, you know, part of the give and take. It's part of letting your child explore it's even part of you continuing to explore and play. Right, and you are not afraid of being around males and, and, and didn't feel intimidated, which happens to a lot of girls, right? Right. Now, you said... And you, you know what, but let me give you another thing. Sure. Guys are intimidated from being around girls as well. Boys are intimidated by being around girls. You got girls, it. That's right? the truth. And That's sometimes truth. we forget that, uh -huh. that we could be an intimidating too if we want to. Oh, never. <laughs> Um, what about, you say your parents were the first scientists you met. Why mm -hmm. do you say that? Um, there was never any topic that was not worth discussing in my house. I remember sitting at the table at dinner, and we would discuss things from uh, nutrition and why it was important to eat your meat and potatoes and metabolic cycles to, you know, religion and Christianity and the various types, your, you know, your inner self, your inner strength, to, you know, politics during that time. The civil rights movement was right, full right. in swing. You know, who was who, what was the role of violence and nonviolence in it. And why do I call that being a scientist? Because it's being willing to explore, willing to ask the questions. And, you know, sometimes people say you have to see both sides of the topic. It's not whether you see both sides. It's can you objectively put together a set of questions to analyze those questions, get input. You know, we couldn't sit there and have these discussions sort of, oh, well, here's what I think. You have to read the books. You have to have some information you can bring to the table. And it wasn't done in a way that, now here's your assignment. <laughs> it was just part of life. It was just life. fun. It was part of it life. It was just right. part of life. Yeah. They did things as well for me, which, um, and again, this is my brother and sister tag. You know, I'm tagging right. along right. in a lot right. of this stuff. Right. Um, that included things like, you know, black history, which at that time was not included very right. much right. In, in, school. in schools. Right. So I already knew before I went to school about, you know, the, the light bulbs and, you know, Matthew Henderson and all those kinds of uh, Henson and all those kinds of things in terms of, you know, polar exploration. I knew about those things, so there wasn't anything that I didn't think I could do. Now, as a parent, uh, you're explaining how your parents helped you become a, a scientist and, and all the other things that you ended up doing. 
were there any books in particular that, that, that motivated you as you were growing up? You just mentioned some, but for parents who are watching, what are some of the things that, that they can help with? What are some of the tools they can give kids? What books to read? What, what things to do? Well, there is a really interesting um, survey that was done by Bayer Corporation that I do a lot of work with on science literacy. They asked uh, scientists from the American Association for the Advancement of Scientists, the AAAS, they asked these scientists what caused them to go into science and when did they know they wanted to do it. Most of them said it was by the time they were 11 years old and the most important factor was their parents. Right. How did that happen? It did regardless of whether their parents were in the science fields or not. The reason why it was important is because their parents told them and helped them to see that education was important. And not just sort of, you know, how we sit down and lecture and say, Johnny, you know, it's really important. For you. <laughs> that doesn't work. That's it doesn't not, ever work. Not, yeah, it doesn't right. work. That's but by going to, taking them to the zoos, taking them to museums, uh, buying them books, chemistry sets, microscopes, being willing to explore things with them, that told the kids that this was something worth being involved with and that their interest in these areas were worthwhile. Right, right. You know, so, you know, it's really interesting. When you have to overcome a hurdle as a child, both in terms of, well, can I do this and meet the challenge that, you know, is imposed on you because of your, your talents and things, but then you have to overcome the hurdle of what society expects of you. You overcome the hurdle of what your parents expect of you or what they think you can or can't do. That's a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. what these, these scientists said was it was really about sort of their parents showing them that this was important. You know, James Baldwin said children seldom do what their parents tell them to do, but they rarely fail to imitate them. So if we want our kids sort of learning, being willing to explore, meet challenges, you know, striving for excellence, then we have to do that as well because kids do what we do. Walk the talk. Mm -hmm. Now, if parents are too busy to do that, I know you run international science camps every year. Tell me about those and how you spark creativity in those camps. Well, let me, let me go back to something. Why is all of this important? I just, I just want to say, That's why, a are good question. why are we talking why about science? Talking you know, about it's not this? just because right. I want some more buddies sure. in the field with me. <laughs> why are we talking about this? Why right. is it important? I wanted to do it because, for me, you know, growing up in the 60s, just think about it. It was, you know, we were doing space exploration. We were talking about, um, you know, breaking the atom apart into its component pieces. There was so much going on. That was the time we started talking a lot more about ecology and those yes, things. Yes. Um, you know, rapid advancements. So we would hear things about heart transplants that were occurring Technology during that time. Was, there was an yeah. incredible explosion. But why is this important? Because it affects our everyday lives. That's the reason I talk about it. And we can't abdicate our responsibility for it. When you look at it, so much of what we do is dependent upon the tools we develop, the science and the technology yes. we develop. That's right. And we need everybody involved. You see, we can't just abdicate our responsibility and say, oh, that doesn't have anything to do with me, when the decision to use, you know, various sets of chemicals to propel bullets, you know, to make a beautiful fireworks display, that rests with the individuals who are designing the tools. Absolutely, yeah. You know, we ask every day for people to make decisions on their health care, yeah. right? We tell women, well, if you have this kind of history, then you need these kind of mammograms, and you need this, and you need pap smears this often, and all those kinds of things. How do you decipher that? Right. You need some level of science literacy. Exactly. And that's some of the pieces we forget. When we talk about... Um, things like what's going on with the environment and global warming and climate change, it becomes difficult to understand why that's important unless you remember a little bit about buffered systems, a little bit about your pH and all those kinds of things. Not that you have to be able to solve the equations or write the information, but we're but asked to vote on it. Right. So you should be able to read that article in the newspaper and figure out how to vote on it. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't mm -hmm. be left up to, you know, politicians who, by the way, should also be able to read that article in the newspaper Some of them don't. to yeah. figure out how to vote on it. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that are really important. So that's the reason why I talk about science literacy. Not right. the next generation of professional scientists, but science literacy. For we everyone. All need it. We Not just all children. Need it. Everyone. Not just for children, for everyone. Because what's going on right now, we're making those calls. Right. We're making those decisions right now. That's right. So when we go back and we say, you know, how do we maintain that interest in children? I have to say over and over again, 
It's by, as adults, showing that we're interested. One of the things that we cannot do is something everybody, you know, it's, a, it's one of those fun things folks say. They said, well, you know, I can't program the VCR, but my grandbaby can. Now, nothing about that is cute. <laughs> Nothing about that is cute. <laughs> I say that about computers. But, <laughs> yeah, I see what a, you mean. Right, you right. You know, why are we saying, you know, five or six-year-olds, you know, here we are in our 50s, 40s. Oh, can't the figure it out. We can't figure it out. It's not that hard. It's because we've sort of closed our mind to it. Okay, right. We're, so, we're becoming lazy is what you're saying about, about science literacy, too. Well, I think, I think adults become very lazy about learning. Right. Period. You know, you can't teach old dog new tricks. Yes, you can. <laughs> Well, but, but, but the International Science Camp, one of the things that you're, back to that, one of the things that you, 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 you talk about, not only about teaching them creativity, which I want you to define what that is, but also about um, innovation and critical thinking skills. Well, when I left NASA, uh, one of the first things I did, not my day job, my for love of job, it's put together uh, an organization called the Dorothy Jemison Foundation for Excellence, which was named Your after my mother. Yeah. And the whole idea is that we can't all be number one, but we can all be excellent Absolutely. in what we do. Absolutely. And, you know, we have this whole thing in the society, like, I'm number one. If you're not number one, then forget it. What, what, what does that what mean? What about number two and number three? <laughs> you know, but you can be excellent. You can do a good yes, job. Yes, of course. So we put, I put that together, and our primary project is called The Earth We Share which is an international science camp. We bring in kids from 12 to 16 years of age from all around the country, all around the world, to solve uh, problems. And what we do is we give the kids problems like predict the hot public stocks of year 2030, design the world's perfect house, how many people can the earth hold. Why do we do this? Because that's what happens. You get yeah. problems just as a statement. They don't come packaged nice and, and neat. They always come as an idea. So we teach them how to think about the ideas, mm -hmm. how to bound the problem. You know, what does that question mean to me? What resources do I have available? You know, those resources are my team members. You know, they're the things around me. You know, what libraries I have. What Can I go out and do some field research? Mm -hmm. Can I ask some people? Um, can I do some experiments? So we teach them how to do that. Okay. And then they have to give their solutions back. And they work in teams because you never do anything in teams. Even if you sit there and you write your book by yourself, somebody's going to publish it and have to put yeah, you know, everything it, in life. You everything work in teams. is a team. Right. And how do you explain the information? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, we want the kids also to know that they sh that it isn't what does this science have to do. Um, let me do that again. One of the things that often happens is kids say, what does this have to do with me? We don't want them ever asking that question. So we want to put a lot of their scientific studies in a framework that they automatically know what it has to do with them. So let me do, one group said, design the world's perfect house. What does that mean? They have to define what perfect means to them, mm -hmm. right? They have to design what, to define what a house is. Mm -hmm. What do you include in the world? How are you going to view that? So each summer we've done the, a different question. And one summer when the students were working on that question, they decided they were going to build a luxury house, right? <laughs> so wow. this was going to be the one that was just going to be fallout fabulous. Oh. And that was, they said, well, we know perfect could mean other things, but this is what we uh, want to do. They, yeah. Another group decided that what perfect were for them was a house that anyone around the world could use that it would be affordable. Oh. So it being a prefab house that was circular because different people prayed in different directions and things like that. Because, and then they looked at the kinds of materials would be available. Another group decided perfect meant one that was as sustainable as possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so they went and looked at, you know, how do you get off the grid? How do you insulate the house? These kind of things. But each time they understood that there was, there was a part of them that they were putting into it. Right. But in exploring that part of themselves to understand that, you know, some people like to pray, some people think perfect is going to be luxurious, they also explored all these other areas so they knew what it had to do with them. Right, right. You know, so it's not about us bringing out, it, it's more about the, the camp and the program bringing out their creativity right. rather than, than sort of teaching it to them. So how do you define creativity in that case? It's exploring you know, all the different options. I, you know, I think creativity is very much a part of the arts and the sciences. 
It's both. I think it's not just people think, oh, sciences. it's music and it's the arts. It's not. I think of creativity as very simply, it's, um, it's our ability to express ourselves and to try to explore the parts of the world around us. And it goes in the arts and the sciences. And the way I differentiate the arts and the sciences, the arts are our attempt to explain the universe as it's peculiar to us as right, individuals. Right, it's right. our it's experience. It's the universe that's ex that was well, the universe that we've experienced mm -hmm. personally. And the sciences are our understanding of the universe that's not unique to us as mm -hmm. individuals. It's that the universe is, it be, can be experienced by everyone. Right. So these are the things that, you know, that from place to place, from person to person in the sciences, we're going to find it the same. Right. But, you know, the arts is where I've had a unique experience, and I want to explain it to you. Right. You know, and, and no, both of them are needed. Right. Both uh, of them yeah, are needed. And that, that makes the, the whole person, and, and you use both sides of your brain. Uh, and, yeah, and and the scientific and the artistic. And well, you know, the, I think of the, they talk about analytical, intuitive. Shouldn't we be using all of it? Exactly. I mean, exactly. and I think we do, <laughs> but... You know. um, let's talk about, because this is a concern for America, and that is that we need to continue to be leaders in science and technology. Mm -hmm. And you play an important role with that. You're, you're doing product development here in Texas, um, and, and you, you hold seminars, you teach courses. Let's talk about seeing the future in science and technology. What are some of the things we need to know um, yeah, as parents and as adults? Well, you know, it was really interesting because we did a project called Seeing the Future, which was science, engineering, and education. It was when I was a professor at Dartmouth. We held this workshop where we brought, uh, you know, scientists and engineers who had won National Medal of Technology, National Medal of Engineering, theologian. Uh, we brought economists together. They came from physics and mathematics and biology and psychology all and all areas. these fields to say, what are the best uses of public funding for basic research? Because the government funds an awful lot of science uh, and engineering. Right. And what they were concerned about, they, they said they came because they were concerned that the United States was not as robust anymore. Mm -hmm. And what their concern was that, first of all, we don't do enough in terms of education. We don't spend enough time with education. We're not including all of our talented uh, children and students and people in it. So we have to make sure that we increase the number of women and re re increase the number of underrepresented minorities in the fields. They were also very concerned that we'd gotten very short-sighted. Short-sighted in the sense of we no longer are as willing to fund basic research, which means I just want to know how a DNA molecule assembles itself. Right? That was done in the 1940s with Watson and Crick, right? That was done in the 19, 1950s and early 1960s when we mm -hmm. looked at how, how these things work and how the, you, know, you stop certain gene uh, expression. Guess what we're doing right now? That's the whole basis of the biotech industry. That's right. Nobody That's right. knew that that was going to be the basis of a biotech industry, but we're drawing on the work from the 60s right now, and we're like, we're really lauding it. What are we doing right now? That's just, I want to know. Right. And they felt that it was important to in, in, uh, continue that robustness, not to always have a commercial uh, end in sight when you do research. Mm -hmm. It's okay mm -hmm. to do it sometimes, mm -hmm. but not always, because you need that, that robustness, that just that thirst for knowledge. They were also concerned that uh, sometimes, you know, we get on this kick where we throw way too much money on one, in one particular area, right? right? So the, the amounts of money that uh, went into looking at uh, HIV, AIDS, right. and other mm -hmm. things left a lot of other diseases out. Right out in the um, sort of out in the cold but yet though the learning about those other diseases could also help us with HIV AIDS but lots of other people have issues so that there is a sort of um, a need to sort of refurbish the groundwork right, of right. science the basic science the basic sciences. Um, you know there are not a lot of people that have their face on the cornflakes uh, uh, cover there are not a lot of people who are, you, you wrote a book about your life you, you're a pioneer you were 16 when you went to Stanford, 
because um, they play really good football. Ah, uh, there you go. <laughs> they play really good football. I was a football fanatic in high school. I played intramural uh, football at Stanford. Go. That's the reason I wanted to go. But anyway, keep going. But 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 I want to ask you. I mean, uh, how you know what are the the skills, the leadership, the character traits, leadership skills that you had early on to be who you are today, the successful person that you are today. And you're still having an impact. You're still working on your legacy. You're working with kids. You're working with science. What is it about you that, that, that was unique? Wow. You know, it's really hard to sort of look at yourself and say, hey, here's what's unique. Because to, to me, I'm just me. I know I have this energy. Um, I always want to know I'm a busybody. Um, I don't think that's unique. I think that perhaps if there was any piece that was unique, if I could say that, it was that I believed in myself. I didn't think I had to have someone's permission to do, to do something. What How do you know you're living smart? Um, I know I'm living smart when I can smile. I've always judged it by whether or not I can maintain my smile. If I can't maintain my smile, I need to go and sit in a corner somewhere, rejuvenate with my cat on my lap. I like that. That's a great answer. <laughs> and to learn more about this topic, go to our website. There you'll also find a complete resource list. You can also email us or call us with your comments at 713-743-8513. That's 713-743-8513. And that's our show for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Remember to live smart. I'm Patricia Gross. Have a creative week. transcript of this program, send 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.